John Paul II. And I expect that uh, Darius and Farrell Yaroslav will, will perhaps mention this. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Father Yaroslav Kupchak. He's speaking from Rome. Uh, and also uh, Darius uh, Karvich, who is speaking also from Rome. But uh, more I am in because... Krakow. I am in Krakow. You're in Krakow. Oh, yes. my goodness. How geographically confusing for us. <laughs> <laughs> but Darius is in Rome, I understand. Yes. And uh, we're also going to have Nazila Ganea, who is in Oxford, and Daniel Greenberg, who's going to be speaking from uh, from London, from the suburbs of London. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation because this whole uh, anniversary year, the 40th anniversary year of solidarity, gives us a tremendous encouragement and opportunity to to look back uh, at the extraordinary and world-changing events of 40 years ago in Poland uh, and, and why they happened and how they happened and the impact they had on us, but also to look forward. This is not, it's, it's not about having a history lesson, uh, though the history is important, but it's about what does that mean to us and for us now? And, and I'm sure Darius, brother uh, Yaroslav will We'll, we'll look, for example, at the teachings of John Paul II, because not only is 2020 the 40th anniversary of the Solidarity Movement, but on the 30th of November this year, we'll be, re we'll be uh, celebrating and, and remembering the 40th anniversary of the signing of the encyclical Divis uh, in Misericordia, Rich in Mercy, which St. John Paul made remarks that were extremely important for the self-definition of solidarity uh, as a movement at that time. And as I say, we're joined by, by, by Nazila and Daniel. Naz is going to give us a human rights perspective and Daniel will be focusing from a Jewish law and ethics perspective. But, but this year has brought another important encyclical. For earlier this month, Pope Francis, uh, at the tomb of St. Francis of Assisi, after whom he uh, took his papal name, and on the anniversary of the saint's death and the day before uh, St. Francis of Assisi's feast day, signed a very important papal encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, a phrase often used by St. Francis himself. I, I think it's a really important encyclical, not just because of its size, and it's about 43,000 words, so it's, it's no mean document, but he, he speaks of a number of things in a very thoughtful and indeed, in my view, inspirational way. And he specifically mentions solidarity, uh, to which he, he refers as being our responsibility for the fragility of others. There's another marvellous phrase that he uses, thinking and acting in terms of community. Indeed, the, the, the whole of the reference there actually reads, solidarity means more than engaging in sporadic acts of generosity. It means thinking and acting in terms of community. I, I think it's a a marvellous phrase. But, but the encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, goes beyond the Catholic community. He points out that St. Francis, and this was at the time of the Crusades, we should remember, went to Egypt to visit the Sultan, Maliki et Kamel, a visit which entailed considerable hardship, not least given St. Francis' own poverty and scarce resources, and the great difference, distances to be travelled, and differences of language and culture and religion. And Pope Francis takes this precedent of St. Francis, not only for the ecumenical engagement, uh, which he has had, for example, with Bartholomew, the Orthodox Patriarch, and he refers to that, but also with the Grand Imam, Ahmad al Taib in Abu Dhabi, where together they declare that God has created all human beings equal in rights, duties, and dignity, and has called them to live together as brothers and sisters. Another marvelous definition of solidarity, but a statement that he says was no mere diplomatic gesture, but a reflection born of dialogue and common commitment. What a marvelous thing to be happening at this difficult and challenging time. So today, in this panel, we follow the example both of St. Francis and Pope Francis by meeting together from different faith traditions. Fratelli Tutti, in fact, Fratelli e Sorera Tutti, because of course Naz is going to bring another very important uh, aspect uh, to us. But first, as I say, we start with Father Yaroslav Kupchak. 
uh, Pavel Yarosov is, is a Dominican. He's a lecturer from the Pontifical University in Krakow, which, where he currently is, but also from the Pontifical University St. Thomas Aquinas Angelicum in Rome. And he's one of the world's top experts on John Paul II's Christian anthropology. He's the author of Destined for Liberty, the human person in the philosophy of John Paul II, and is president of the Society of Dogmatist Theologians in Poland. It's a great honor and delight to be joined by you, uh, Father Yaroslav. Uh, I will introduce the other four speakers uh, as they come. But first, in normal times, I would have said you have the floor. But of course, now we're operating on Zoom. So you have the mic and you have the screen. And it's a delight to have you with us. Um, thank you for this uh, very kind introduction and uh, invitation. Um, uh, certainly, I will uh, speak about solidarity from a Krakow and uh, Polish perspective and from um, our own um, experience, historical experience of, um, of Poles. But uh, first, let me start that um, by saying that certainly solidarity uh, can have many meanings. Um, we can say uh, about uh, being in solidarity with evil. Uh, people committing crimes in prison can be in solidarity with each other, uh, saying that they will not reveal the details of the crime to the prosecutors or to the court. They are in solidarity with whoever initiated the crime. They are in solidarity with each other. So there is uh, certainly a, a philosophical question about a community in evil and community in good. However, if we speak about uh, human solidarity, the first images uh, that come to our mind uh, are the images of uh, people being in uh, solidarity uh, in good, in ethical good. And I think this would be my uh, first point to state that solidarity is an ethical phenomenon. Solidarity is an ethical phenomenon. Uh, yes, uh, solidarity can be uh, um, triggered by economic events or political events, but human, human beings engage in, in solidarity with others as far as they discover the ethical values and the ethical bond between each other. The question remains, what kind of ethics and what kind of values we are uh, talking about. And certainly uh, in speaking of solidarity, one should talk about a certain culture of solidarity. What triggers solidarity? What happens that at certain point, people who are divided between each other, people who are look uh, at each other sometime with um, animosity, envy, People are able to engage in the solidarity. What are the border conditions to trigger solidarity? Ethics is first. What, what, what next? Well, uh, thinking of uh, solidarity in recent years, um, certainly three images come to mind. Uh, the first image is the uh, so-called revolution of dignity in Ukraine a couple of years uh, ago, um, which uh, was triggered by the very tragic but important events of the so-called Euromaidan in uh, Kiev, where people united uh, against the regime of uh, former President Yanukovych uh, and opted for a, a unification uh, of Ukraine with, with Europe. Second event uh, is what is happening nowadays in Belarus. These are very moving um, images, how the whole nation comes together uh, in the situation of uh, stolen elections by the former president, Lukashenko, 
Uh, and despite a very dangerous situation, we see thousands of people uh, marching against uh, armed police uh, men, special forces and um, uh, uh, soldiers. We know about uh, a very tragic events of torture, uh, suffering of those uh, brought uh, to uh, prison. But at the same time, we have a festa in Belarusia now, uh, which we know from our own uh, Polish tradition from the uh, so-called Feast of Solidarity, which I will um, go uh, to in, in a moment. And the third image, images that come to mind, these are the images of the movement Black Lives Matter in the United States, which uh, always, which also brought people together uh, in a protest against uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian um, uh, injustice. Um, my um, idea of something that brings those three uh, images together is a protest against injustice. So in a situation uh, when people are faced with a clear injustice, with suffering of others, with lying, uh, with uh, public, um, public lie, as is in clear case in, uh, in Belarusia, it was in Ukraine, people react ethically, people protest. So uh, this brings us to a, a second moment of this ethical discovery. What is solidarity? Solidarity uh, appears in the moment when in a situation when we are faced with clear evil, we, um, we stand on the side of truth, of justice on the side of suffering, a great uh, um, uh, 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 Catholic uh, theologian, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, uh, was um, talking about authority of the suffering. The suffering person, the person that uh, undergoes injustice has a certain authority that uh, in is able to bring in the bystanders what is the best in, in them. And after uh, talking about those three images, let me uh, go back to Polish experience of um, uh, solidarity. Uh, uh, seeing from this ethical uh, point of view, um, solidarity, uh, uh, as we know, uh, 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 was created as a social movement in 1980, in uh, August of 1980. And it's part of our national memory that one important event um, led to creation of solidarity. This very important event was the pilgrimage of the Pope John Paul II to Poland in June of uh, 1979. So about um, one year before creation of um, solidarity. Many commentators, um, Catholic and not uh, Catholic agree that there is a deep link between those two uh, events. In other words, the pilgrimage of John Paul II triggered uh, culture of solidarity created something new between people that enabled solidarity to, um, to come forward several months ago. What was specific about this pilgrimage of John Paul II to Poland in 1979? Um, those people who remember uh, uh, that event, I was um, a teenager, at uh, that time, not really interested in religion and the church. But my older colleagues um, uh, remember that this was a experience of dignity. There was somebody who came, one of us, 
uh, Karol Wojtyła, uh, John Paul II, who in this very divided communist nation under living under communist uh, regime, gave all the people who participated in the pilgrimage, um, millions and millions of Poles, unexpected experience of dignity. This dignity came with uh, several other features. First, uh, Pope spoke beautiful Polish language, language that reminded us of who we are, of our tradition. That's also part of the dignity of uh, being a nation, being a human being, being a person. Uh, this language, this Polish language that the Pope spoke was deeply ethical. He was talking, he was using the words that were forbidden in the communist regime. Conscience, uh, freedom, community, responsibility for the other, uh, taking care of the other, helping the other. This was for millions and millions of people what uh, commentators had called awakening experience. So through a new language that the Pope proposed, our Poles were able to look at each other differently. They were able to um, uh, experience community between those very different people. Yes, we had anti-communist um, uh, uh, protests before the Pope's pilgrimage, but every time in those protests, there was all, only a one part of the society protesting. In 1956, these were the workers in Poznań and uh, one part of Poland. In 68, these were the students, these were the academics, the rest of the, Pol the, rest of the Poles were not interested. And then during the solidarity movement, uh, everybody came together. The solidarity union was created at the universities uh, between um, people living in villages, between academics, between all kinds of people, between in, in the police stations, in the military and so on uh, uh, and so on. So in a sense, we can think about uh, this triggering or awakening experience as a experience um, of creating community between each other. There are many languages that create division between people. There are economic injustices that are, as the Black Lives Matter movement uh, reveals to us, there are racial, uh, uh, racial injustices, but we need a language that does not oppose us against each other, men against women, poor against rich, white against black, uh, uh, Jews against Catholics, uh, people of different religions uh, uh, against each other. We need a, a, a language that proposes that uh, but pro proposing creates this deep unity between us. And this is what, what created, um, this was what was created by John, John Paul II. Um, so let me uh, uh, shortly summarize what is particularly important for me. Solidarity uh, is an ethical experience. It has to be about ethics. Secondly, it has to be about uh, specific ethics because we have uh, in the modern, modern postmodern society, a conflict of very different uh, values uh, and very different, different ethical systems. But we need a proposal of ethical system that does not oppose us 
against each other, but that binds us to, together. And thirdly, the very triggering moment of this um, uh, uniting us together is a compassion, uh, or uh, I guess Darius will talk more uh, 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 about, about it. We have a little plot of uh, dividing the, 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 the theme between each other. And Darius will talk about mercy. Uh, let me use then the, the weaker word, compassion. Compassion toward the, uh, the the suffering. I guess these are the, the 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 most important things that I would like to say at the at the at the beginning. Thank you for uh, for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's been a, a marvelous start, uh, Father Yaroslav, uh, and uh, and brings us on indeed uh, on those questions of of ethics and ethical experience. And I'd like very much to come back to that a little later, but. But we're now going to move to, to Professor Nazila Ganea. She's the Director of the International Human Rights Law Programs at the University of Oxford and serves as Vice Chair of the Board of Governors of the Universal Rights Group. And she's a trustee of Freedom Declared Foundation. She's authored, co-authored and edited lots of academic and indeed United Nations publications, including the Oxford University Press publication, Freedom of Religion, or belief and international law commentary. Uh, and indeed, that was how I first came in contact with Naz was over this question of freedom of religion or belief. I'm delighted that she's joining us now. Naz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a, a pleasure to join uh, the esteemed panelists. Uh, let me connect with uh, what has been said before um, by uh, remembering that in uh, 1992, uh, 1991 rather, August 1991, I was teaching English in Poland and uh, the, the headmistress of the school where I was teaching English um, said, I have extra ticket, not tickets. Uh, well, I think it was called a ticket, but I'm sure there's a more respectable term for it. But I have uh, extra permission. <laughs> you can join me to see uh, John Paul II in Krakow. Um, uh, because we were just outside Krakow, and there I went. It was all in Polish, uh, but I was uh, very moved by just the, the energy um, and the you know, reception given um, uh, the Pope in, on that occasion. Um, I'll also follow on from my uh, predecessor on the panel by saying that um, my focus will be on human rights law. I hope peppered with my own impressions of some Baha'i thoughts, um, and um, indeed this language um, of helping us support one another towards at least minimum respect and standards for protection was, was you know, perhaps one way that we can uh, describe the modern human rights movement. Um, but whereas it might have a framework for it, my question is, does it have the, the authority and the inspiration for achieving all of its ex objectives. And that's pretty much my um, objective in the few minutes that I have before me. We can say that solidarity was recognized early on in the modern human rights movement as being an important pillar for its success. For example, solidarity is implicit in articles 28 and 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We see the aspiration in 28 and then maybe 29 is trying to find uh, means for its advancement. Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can be fully recognized. But, you know, here we are uh, just uh, at the tail end of the devastation of war, conflict, and indeed the Holocaust. And we have the aspiration of a social and international order in which equal rights and freedoms can be honored for everybody. So, you know, how, how are we to achieve this? Article 29 um, puts some efforts towards this and says that everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. 
So solidarity can be traced through from there in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to a number of other human rights standards. And perhaps a key one would be the Declaration on the Right and Responsibility of Individuals, Groups and Organs of Society to Promote and Protect universal, Universally Recognized Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. That's a bit of a mouthful, but basically the Human Rights Defenders <laughs> Declaration that took over a decade to draft. Um, and let's look at some of the language here. It's article one says that everyone has the right individually and in association with others to promote and to strive for the protection and realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Um, why am I putting so much emphasis on this? Because um, universal uh, human rights are a birthright. They are recognized that uh, every human being uh, innately possesses these rights and therefore there should be a safeguarding for the individual to be able to flourish and fulfill, achieve their full potential. And that regardless of where we live, who we are, our status, um, that, uh, and regardless of the circumstances, uh, let's say there is conflict, et cetera, that these standards should be respected. Um, human rights law puts the onus on states to be able to uh, facilitate these rights. But we all know very well that the state cannot act alone and many rights are um, indeed upheld or violated at the grassroots level before state authorities could even come become involved um, even with the best will in the world. So this role of the solidarity of persons in upholding human rights becomes critical. And I'm thinking not only of people standing up for their own rights, but actually standing up for the rights of others. Um, Article 18 also of the Human Rights Defenders Declaration talks about duties within the community. Um, and it recognizes a role, not only for the state, but also individuals, groups, institutions, non-government organizations, et cetera, as having an important role and responsibility in contributing to the promotion of human rights and uh, to achieving a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms of uh, the Universal Declaration are recognized. So we see sort of a, a, a direct correlation between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and, and this declaration some 60 or so years later. But the language of the Human Rights Defenders Declaration is the recognition of the right to stand up for the rights and freedoms of others and to promote human rights um, of oneself and others, um, either alone or in institutions such as non-government organizations or indeed faith-based organizations. We might recognize that human rights has had an important role in protecting a minimum standard of respect and enjoyment for each and all. Um, but what it has gained um, in advancing clarity and a safety net for all, um, on the other hand, it perhaps lacks inspiration in reaching deep into the deepest springs of human motivation and drawing creative power from the minds of spiritual resources. What I'm referring here is to the discussion of um, limitless standards, such as forgiveness and trust, preferring others to ourselves, love, sacrifice, and service. Um, it's not surprising that as legal standards or political objectives, human rights um, standards rarely mention these values. So where I'm going with this is to suggest that perhaps it's helpful to view human rights standards as the instrument or the vehicle. But what about the fuel? Could it be that the spiritual powers latent within us or the ethical standards within, uh, latent within us provide the fuel for that vehicle to operate? The vehicle is not, um, the, the vehicle is just there. Um, the motivation, the fuel, the power that makes it go, um, it lies at the grassroots and perhaps that capacity is in each and every one of us. 
human rights law itself draws on the obligations and responsibilities of states to try to motivate them to accountability, to oversight, to review, and to reporting. However, it doesn't have anything to draw upon in motivating the individual's duty to the community, even though it recognizes that duty to the community in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Human Rights Defenders Declaration, as we just discussed. In fact, there's a lot of danger and risk in standing up for the rights of others. This might just be discomfort, or we may pay with our lives, depending on the context in which we reside. There, uh, you know, the UN is replete with reports of reprisals against those that dared stand up for rights and for the rights of others, especially the most vulnerable and the weakest in society. So the Human Rights Defenders Declaration is only recognizing the remarkable fact that individuals around the world are prepared and have this show this propensity to act in support of one another, regardless of uh, the consequences. And what, fe what feeds this seemingly endless fount of sacrifice, love, and deep desire to stamp out injustice and prejudice has been described as spiritual values or ethical commitments. They provide the fuel for individuals and groups to uh, drive knowledge about human rights standards, to push the normative protections of human rights law, to follow up, to report, and to ensure that the UN human rights mechanisms, for example, have the support, knowledge, and direction to function. So in this frame, the primary solidarity that human rights needs from religion and interfaith dialogue is to stand up for these spiritual values, to direct their followers and actors, to embody them more courageously and effectively, and to not perversely construct borders and restrictions around love and sacrifice. Of course, limits and constraints are antithetical to spiritual values and ethical com commitments, since these resources cannot be depleted. In saying all of this, I don't want to suggest that religion is somehow the possessor of spiritual values. Of course, it's, uh, I think it would be very difficult to find a religious community or belief community that suggests that these are not um, the beliefs uh, that it is uh, purporting, uh, purporting to advance. Uh, but you know, there isn't a unique position. Of course, there are also belief um, organizations that, that also reach deep into these resources uh, for their inspiration. I hope that's sketched out something of uh, perhaps a relationship between religion, interfaith dialogue, solidarity, and human rights. And I look forward to learning more from the panelists and our discussions. Thank you. Now, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I will uh, certainly easily remember that uh, uh, delightful notion of the, the vehicle and the fuel and that the fuel is coming from this spiritual and values dimension of things. Uh, you're right, of course, the law on its own does not necessarily have the impetus for its own implementation. Uh, and it's that sense of conviction and passion, which is very much at one uh, with what Father Yaroslav was, was speaking about. We now come to, uh, to Darius uh, Kawovic, and it's a delight to share a, a panel with him again. We did it not very long ago on the 40th anniversary of Solidarity. Uh, Darish is a Polish philosopher, a university lecturer, columnist, uh, and editor-in-chief of the Polish philosophical magazine, Political Theology, which is sharing with us today, not just in terms of his presence, but also in the organization of this event. And, and political theology is very interesting. It, it analyzes the relationships between philosophy, religion, and politics. Uh, Darish is, is a lecturer uh, at Warsaw University, President of the St. Nicholas Foundation, an NGO involved in charitable, educational and scientific activity, and co-author of, of many books and publications. Darius, it's great to have you with us again uh, on this Zoom uh, panel, and uh, I look forward to what you have to say to us today. Thank you. Uh, can you just make sure that you're unmuted? 
Yes, I'm unmuted. <laughs> I'm un unmuted. The line is mine. That's probably the proper expression for our situation. Thank you very much for uh, the, all those uh, voices I've already heard. I'm also very impressed by, by an idea of um, that, say, distinction between fuels and rights. That's a very deep thought, uh, which I think we should, let's say, find in the very center of our uh, found in the very center of our discussion. Uh, despite my uh, conspiracious agreement with Father Yaroslav um, um, on sharing uh, <laughs> subject of the discussion, I would like to come back for a while for, um, for the history of um, solidarity. Um, as uh, John mentioned, we have 40th anniversary, anniversary of signing the Gdańsk agreement in August. And it must be mentioned, I think, that this mass movement of 10 million people was undeniably a result of a deeply religious and ecclesiastical way of life and experiencing the world which may be regarded as a kind of a trademark of Polish social and political culture. Uh, I was also a teenager at the time, but reading many relation after, I realized that many Western intellectuals who visited Poland at the time were actually shocked and surprised by this um, unfortunately, and some even uh, disenchanted by that fact of a religious character of a, of a solidarity. In their understanding the labor union movement of the workers that was set against the oppression of the, 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 the degenerated regime, ought to have been a left-wing movement and therefore and therefore the, an emancipation from religion. Meanwhile, in the striking unions, uh, the church mass were being held regularly with each worker going to confession and taking holy community, etc. etc. And uh, with a church holding an important role in the political negotiation. Of course, um, Father Yaroslav mentioned that we all um, agreed on the unquestionable, obvious relation between these events, between Solidarity and John Paul II, and particularly his first pilgrimage to his homeland. And I think that after years, we can give right to the um, uh, leader of uh, USSR at the time, Leonid Brezhnev, who did not want to allow um, for this uh, to take place. Uh, mm, 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 mm. He was, yes, definitely from his point of view, he was right. Uh, uh, the Pope visit uh, precipitated an um, avalanche, definitely. Uh, it was a beginning, the very beginning of solidarity, there is no doubt. Uh, so there's nothing strange that during the August strikes at Gdańsk Shipyard, uh, on the gate, uh, there were the picture of a Holy Mary from Częstochowa behind the portrait of John Paul II. That's a very important gate, uh, well known from countless photographs, uh, where the workers met with the family and where the family were praying not to end uh, that strike in the tragedy. Let me remind that these were not uh, unfounded worries since almost 10 years earlier, the communist powers exercised the army on the streets, drawing the strike in their own blood, so to speak. Uh, as John mentioned, now we have a second anniversary, and it's not a, 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 an important coincidence. Uh, also 40 years ago, on uh, 
30th November 1980, John Paul released his second encyclical titled Dives in Misericordia, in which uh, um, a most genuine version of solidarity that took place in Poland was mentioned and I think defined. Uh, that's, by the way, highly significant here. Uh, is that the definition was taken straight from St. Paul letter to Galatians, presenting the solidarity in the prism of St. Paul appellation, carry each other burdens, carry each other burdens. Mm. The encyclical was published two months from the day of the signing of this agreement, which fittingly mm, represented a certain kind of theological commentary to the events that took, took place in Poland. What is important here, and I think very interesting to understand John Paul's intention and comments on solidarity within the context of the teaching of the divine mercy, what may surprise us totally today, because I mean, what divine mercy um, has have in common with uh, with solidarity. Um, I would say that well-known note of uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, he says that the secret of philosophy is theology. Likewise, the secret of, uh, of theology is anthropology. I think that understanding the Christian thought and the thought of um, present in that encyclic of John Paul II, that requires reversing the formula. I think that according to the say, spirit of a Christian uh, social thought, we should say that the secret of every, of every social, cultural and philosophical um, phenomenon is anthropology. And the secret of, of every anthropology is theology. So in seeking the causes and truths of a social doctrines, doctrines and uh, social phenomenon, we are uh, in, inevitably taken to some conceptual understanding of God. Therefore, to begin analysis or understanding with first causes, we need to start from theology. Uh, in the case of solidarity, that is the theology of the Lord's mercy. Uh, from the Mm -hmm. that point of view, solidarity has very little in common with any secular political or social order. It's not a form of a new, better version of redistribution or social aid or even better social policy. Social order of solidarity is about, that's, I know that's absolutely strange word in a nowadays politics, it's about love loneliness and uh, really human relation and needs which cannot be fulfilled by any kind of a political process. In the 80s during uh, John Paul II's pilgrimage to Poland we all shouted with clear political intention there is no freedom without solidarity. Nie ma wolności bez solidarności. In Italian, there is also a rhyme, non c'è la libertà senza solidarità. Uh, and the Pope, when he heard that, uh, that uh, sh shout, that uh, he had, there is no solidarity without mercy, without love. Uh, I must say, I didn't understand that what he said at the time. Uh, thinking on that, I realized that that that's, that's the order, I mean, that we should go back to the theology of mercy, then to the anthropology, and on the end, we can understand that statement. The theology of solidarity is about Lord Mercy, which appeared, of course, in the mystery of cross. That's a topic of that what Greek called kenosis. Uh, Christ, Christ in the Golgotha is not only the Lord of mercy, uh, so the God who offered Lord's mercy to the weak people, but he is also weak. He, he, that's a re revolution of revelation. He is an object of 
he may be an object of mercy. Uh, the anthropology of solidarity is though about human weakness and loneliness. We are not strong even if we can develop technical and political tools, uh, we cannot answer on deepest human drama and need. So solidarity is a moral and social imperative that comes with experiencing God mercy. Teaching of solidarity, we would almost like to suggest, are a kind of a political theology of mercy. Uh, it's it, the description of a Norman task. What I mean by this, that the social dimension of the teachings lead to the con conclusion that only form of real solidarity is a solidarity between people who understand their weakness and contingency uh, and can build their relation on that. It leads us to the conclusion that the real sharing is a sharing of our weakness. Mm. Awareness of our contingency as a starting point for this issue, uh, that the paradox of Christian solidarity may be expressed in a rather shocking way uh, when it first meets uh, meets in the, the, the eye. Uh, I can express it like that. Like that. I give. I give because I don't possess, not despite the fact that I don't have, and not because of the fact that I have, but precisely due to the fact that I don't have. And furthermore, I help because I need help. I carry the burdens of others because I can't handle the weight of my own. I show mercy and love because I need mercy and love. So the Gospel parable the, of the poor widow offering uh, mm, mm, clearly shows us that what we can truly give mm, is our own, what we can truly give is our own weakness, suffering, contingency, and helplessness. Other coins or currencies uh, than that of widows uh, in this parable are currency, in fact, totally worthless from that point of view. Thank you very much indeed, Didarish. And uh, I I'm struck by the way that uh, this, this surreptitious coming together in advance of yourself and uh, Yaroslav brings together um, notions of, of, of justice and mercy, of ethics and, and love. And uh, and that notion of doing justly and loving mercy is one that I always associate with the great uh, ethics of Judaism uh, and, and the statement in, in Amos, uh, to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. So I feel it is extremely appropriate that we turn now to, to Daniel, to Daniel Greenberg. Uh, Daniel has been, uh, of course, working for a long time at Westminster, where he Drafts Acts of Parliament uh, as Parliamentary Council and has done so for, for some 20 years and is currently the Council for Domestic Legislation in the House of Commons. Uh, but he was also very helpful to us in Northern Ireland uh, because as we were trying to construct or, or reconstruct uh, a, a legislature without a great deal of experience, uh, Daniel was helpful to us in the training of, of a number of our people. But apart from his work in, in legislation, in the, in the normal domestic political sense, he also writes and teaches about Jewish law, ethics and thought. And so it's a great delight to, uh, to be with Daniel again and to welcome him to speak to us on this issue today. Daniel, you are online, as uh, Darius was saying earlier on. Thank you very much. And thank you to my fellow panelists and to Eva as well. Um, and to all who've been involved in organising this extremely stimulating um, event. I noticed that the strap line for the event is solidarity, religion and interfaith, which are, of course, three completely contradictory concepts. Um, religion is a club, even if sometimes it's a club of only one. 
um, and organized religion is an exclusive club, even if the exclusions are perceived rather than intended. Interfaith builds bridges between those clubs and groups, and bridges, of course, uh, um, bridges accentuate the divisions between the things that they are bridging because they bring them into sharp relief. And the essence of solidarity is to deny those divisions and to form a single group and a solid, a solid mass of one. And the only thing that is capable of providing that solidity, the only common denominator is humanity. Now, in Judaism, we have a rabbinic, we have a rabbinic saying, Derech Eretz Kodma Latayla, which is untranslatable, but I will nevertheless uh, have to try to translate it. Um, and it means something like this, good manners, derech eretz, the way of the world, decent behavior, came before, or has to come before, Torah, the Bible, Torah, religion. Manners comes before religion, which is actually quite a profoundly uh, disruptive concept for many religious people. But Berach Eretz, this concept of manners, what the rabbis meant was humanity, including the dignity that Father Yaroslav talked about. Absolutely, that concept of dignity in humanity, including the responsibility and rights that Naz talked about, absolute component of Derech Eretz humanity, and including the mercy and compassion, because whether it's the fuel or the vehicle, the mercy and compassion gives voice to the responsibility and give, does something about the responsibility to other people. So that mercy and compassion, which Arish spoke about, that is also the essence of Berach Eretz As John said, I, I've been involved in conflict resolution as a public lawyer. Um, I wrote the uh, the, the legislation required to give effect to the Good Friday Agreements in Northern Ireland. As he says, I've been involved in, uh, in a number of uh, conflict resolution aspects of Northern Ireland and in many other places in the world. And I have noticed that you never begin conflict resolution until the politics, the religion and the ideology starts to give way to humanity, to recognize humanity whether it's Mothers for Peace, whether it's the Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, nothing can begin until humanity is recognized. So let's be honest. A root and device, whether we like it or not, whether we mean it to or not, whether we want it to or not, religion divides. Religious humanity has the potential to unite us in a very powerful way. So this is not man in search of God, and it's not God in search of man. This is about human beings in search of each other. Daniel, thank you very much indeed for that very potent, concise, precise, and challenging intervention. And I appreciate it very much indeed. And it comes, as you say, out of the actual experience of working in some of these challenging situations. You mentioned the notion of a bridge, and uh, as you know, in Northern Ireland, the party, the political party that I led, was called the Alliance Party because it was people from Protestant and Catholic backgrounds. And the symbol that we used was the symbol of a bridge between the two sides. Dr. Paisley, whom some of you may well remember, who is no longer with us, on one occasion during the talks challenged me about this use of the, of, of the motif of the bridge. And he said, and you know what a bridge is? A bridge is something that goes over to the other side. <laughs> In other words, those that act as a bridge are those who are traitors to their authentic cause. Um, and I suppose this is one of the, the challenges for us as, as people for whom religion has importance, but also relationship has enormous importance. And I'd like to now give each of you the opportunity to pick up uh, on the comments that some colleagues have made. Some of them uh, will be uh, colleagues' comments that you uh, identify with, and some of them you might find to be 
disturbing or, 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 or challenging. But before you actually do that, and, and, and uh, before I invite you to do so, we have a question here from one of our, our listeners, uh, addressed particularly to Naz, but, but I think relevant to, to all of us. And, and it is, do you think that people dedicated to religious freedom are bringing a new value in human rights or just bringing balance to the human rights movement in general? So perhaps as I might, I might, given that that question was put directly to you, I might come to you first to comment on that idea, but also on some of the comments that other colleagues have made, and then uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, with, with all of us involved. Now, let me come to you first. Uh, thank you. Um, certainly, uh, let's be frank about it and say that um, often religion is seen as the problem to many other human rights activists. And the word religion will often come up as one that is indistinguishable from culture and tradition, and very often of harmful traditional practices and therefore violent ones. So it would be surprised, it is a fairly new turn in human rights that we see that women's rights movements, uh, women's rights should be upheld concurrently with freedom of religion or belief, or that religious actors may be part of the solution rather than part of the problem, or that religious, uh, those that are upholding freedom of religion or belief stand in solidarity with the rights and freedoms of those beyond their community. So, Purely looking at the human rights, um, the modern human rights movement and its experience, often religion is, is put in that corner. Uh, but this is obviously essentializing and generalizing and also uh, somewhat negligent of human history <laughs> and um, the civilizational contributions uh, of, of religion to peacemaking, to harmony, to advancing understanding. Uh, in, in you know, many instances. Uh, but some actually view human rights as a, a search for values that everybody can connect with. And perhaps they might think that this can be um, a, a shared foundation that religion may not provide. So you know, there, there are those that uh, very much see human rights as part of their ethical uh, map in life as well. Let's switch now to freedom of religion or belief in, uh, as upheld in human. So amongst the many rights that are upheld, one of them is freedom of religion or belief. Um, and it's a very long standing um, uh, right uh, that we can stretch back to um, in human history to see its predecessors. It, but in, I, I agree that in human rights law and human rights standards, freedom of religion or belief is crucial because it is upholding the significance of the human search for meaning, for matters of conscience, uh, and for working alongside one another in, in matters that are cogent, coherent, and significant in one's life. If the highest search for a, a, a human being cannot be upheld, um, then you know what, what are we upholding? It, it can't only be, of course, bread and butter and voting and shelter are significant, but so is the search for our purpose. Um, and, uh, and also the right not to search for that purpose or to dis ultimately remain indifferent or reject religion. Um, that's, that's the very interesting thing about freedom of religion or belief is that it doesn't restrict it. It doesn't say only those that believe in God or gods or only those that um, have a holy book. As soon as, um, if, if we imagine, you know, the international community drafting a standard on freedom of religion or belief, um, and, you know, the state's actors drafting it and agreeing it, they would be looking for grounds to limit it and to possess it and to control it and to deny it to others. So I think it serves all of us well uh, that it's open, that there is this umbrella term of matters of thought, conscience, and religion or belief because somewhere we will be a minority, somewhere a majority, somewhere um, some traditions will be associated with the state religion um, and, and others they won't. And by keeping it open, there can be a variety of um, matters that can be considered of that cogency, co coherence and seriousness to, to 
merits um, protection under that right. Um, in short, is, is freedom of religion or belief important? I think it's really important in uh, recognizing this um, search in the human being, this potential search in the human being, uh, and also bringing around pluralism and moving, in fact, uh, human rights law, hinting at something beyond its, um, you know, of course, human rights is for this world, but it, there's a hint of something, um, a, a higher search and meaning, uh, and recognizes that this is not just an expression, it is an expression that comes from the deepest yearnings of, of humanity. Thank you very much indeed, Naz. Father Yaroslav, I, I wonder if I might come to you, because you, you used a very interesting term in the later part of your intervention. You talked about ethical experience. You brought these two things together. Often people think of ethics in terms of rules or, or guidance or morals or, or whatever, but, but you brought it together with the notion of experience, which, which actually for me kind of links a little bit with, with Naz's notion of the motor and the fuel, because experience is something that, 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 we, that we have not just in our memory, but in our feelings. And it seemed to me that you were bringing this together with the notion of ethics. I wonder if you might like to say a little bit more about that notion of ethical experience. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, Yes, my uh, my uh, notion, my understanding of ethical ethical experience uh, comes from a deep conviction uh, that uh, human beings, a uh, conviction that comes from um, deep tradition of the Western thought and uh, of the Jewish and uh, Christian. Um, a tradition that human beings are always ethical beings. In other words, um, to be a human being, uh, one has to choose between good and evil. And even more, um, uh, choosing uh, moral good by choosing moral good um, we become um, human beings, we become better beings. So in a sense, uh, this uh, light that comes from our uh, conscience that uh, makes, that puts in front of us the moral choice between good and evil uh, comes to the question to be or not to be, right? That's, um, um, and probably that's uh, 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 my bridge with uh, Daniel here and with his uh, uh, intervention. Um, bridge that um, uh, also refers to what Darius uh, was saying. Um, I like the, the thought about uh, decency, which is also an ethical concept because it's about what you should do and what you should not do, right? Sometimes we do things that we shouldn't do, but we feel bad about it. We feel guilty. That's, uh, that's a typical uh, ethical experience of uh, doing uh, uh, wrong. But the thing is that for um, a lot of people um, uh, in the world, this uh, ethical choice is the same what religion, what, what it comes from religion, right? The decency, what you mentioned, uh, uh, cannot be separated from um, a being a religious uh, person. If we look into the uh, uh, history of Western civilization, we have um, a, a great number of examples of people uh, who did good things, not because of just decency, but because they were deeply religious persons. Uh, the person that comes to me is, of course, Martin Luther King. 
for Martha Luther King to uh, uh, to do uh, to engage in the in this uh, process against racial um, uh, injustice was much above the uh, decency of the society. Um, so it's certainly true for religious people for whom, as you, as you very, very nicely said, the search, that's true that we search for the other person. But for many of us, the search for the other person is no different than search for God. And we search for the other person, especially for those vulnerable, because we search for God, as Darius was saying, right? Um, and the, 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 so, and the last, and the last thing, um, certainly, um, um, uh, Nazila was uh, uh, referring to being persecuted for uh, standing for the right rights of others. Well, uh, in the heroic moments, some of us have heroic moments in our lives, but we know people who had heroic moments in our lives. Decency, in a sense, it's not enough. If we look, um, you know, for, um, uh, uh, um, in a sense, there is, there is a link between natural morality, I mean, and, I don't know, we can perhaps call it the spiritual fuel, uh, but the, the strength that comes from, uh, from God, from our searching for, um, uh, uh, for God. So this is also ethical experience, right? This is also ethical experience. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I want to come back to Daniel in a, in a minute on this question of, of, of respect and relationships, of, of, of decency and, and that which develops from it. Uh, but before that, Darius, I wanted to pick up with yourself because it seemed to me that in, in, in particularly in the later part of, of what you were saying, you were talking about some things that were really quite paradoxical when you were talking about the the strength of those who are weak or the, the strength that can only emerge out of the weakness. I, I show mercy and love because I need mercy and love, not because I have a superabundance of these things that I can afford to, to exert them with others. I, 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 ha I have the need for these things. And I'll tell you what it reminded me of. I, I have found in, in many situations of violent political conflict that uh, the people who are on the weaker side of the conflict, if you like, um, very often engage by saying that someone else has to do something. For example, I engage with Palestinians in the, in the, in the Middle East and they say, well, the rest of the world needs to do this and this and this and this. And, and I say to them, and how long do you think you're going to wait for them to do that? because there's absolutely no motivation on the part of the strong to give up their strong position for your sake. And they say, well, but, but we're weak. We can't possibly do anything of that kind. And I say to them, well, the interesting change or development or discovery in a sense, it seemed to me uh, as, a, as a Northern Protestant was a discovery by Irish Republicans who regarded themselves and quite reasonably as weaker that actually any change depended on them reframing their approach to things. Mm. They, they didn't have power over anybody else, but they had a degree of power over themselves and what they would do themselves. And by actually changing that, not suddenly all becoming very loving and, <laughs> or anything of this kind, but actually nevertheless changing and saying, well, we have to, we have to take responsibility for this ourselves. And it's the weak that can actually make the changes much more than the strong, because the strong is, in a way, in a gilded cage, mm -hmm. where it is not possible easily to give these things up. So I, I was very interested in this notion, this sort of paradoxical notion that, that transcends normal rationality in, in, in opening a new door. And I wonder if you might just say just a little more about that before we come back to Daniel. 
that's uh, that's very much on uh, on that um, extremely uh, enlightened division of uh, Nazila, because uh, I think that solidarity in some important aspect, and we forgot about it in most cases. That's not a, it's not a political, social, economical, uh, legal solution. That's a, that's that's the side of a right of a, a agreement between people, and governments, etc. Uh, what what Nazila says, and I think that's very deep, is that we should be absolutely conscious of what is the root of those solutions, that when, when they became rootless, they will die, definitely. I mean, the end of our laws we are so proud of uh, in, in the beginning of 21st century, uh, it's under a big risk nowadays, because some way of let's say metaphysical tradition, not only religious one, but metaphysical in general, uh, is going to disappear. And that part exactly is very difficult and become more and more paradoxical. And that's exactly what I, I think, if I'm not wrong, Daniel mentioned. It's a question of relation between people which are before or behind the legal relation. I mean, uh, what I like in the mouth of a lawyer, <laughs> especially who, let's say, become a philosopher and, if I'm not wrong, theologian also. Mm, it was looking like in that what you said, that, I mean, that's a pretty important dimension for you of thinking. So I would say that What's, what, 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 what is, from that point of view, which is not purely re religious, because I can I take, looking for witnesses, I would uh, remind Max Scheller, um, uh, for example, the German phenomenologist, who was ins insisting very strongly that we are living in society who stop belief in death, for example, in all kinds of contingency. I mean, why do we send away cementaries from our, from our uh, towns? Is it really only a, a reason of health, I mean? Or we don't want to be bothered by a thought of that? Why we don't want to remember about uh, uh, pain and uh, sicknesses? Why they are never present on the first page of our magazines? A part of a part, a part of an examples of horror, who are a, 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 a part of uh, infotainment, infotainment only, nothing having having anything common with mercy. Uh, but the problem is that building that real between human relation may be based only on our deep consciousness of our weakness. I mean, sharing weakness, that's a first, I mean, everyone knows it from the French relation. When the French relation started, when we are ready, when we are really ready to open our weakness between someone, to share our weakness with someone. I mean, that's a starting point of a possibility of really human uh, giving. The idea of uh, John Paul II's uh, theology of solidarity, if I understand it properly, because I'm overwriting a little bit some ideas on that, what he wrote, but I think that, it's, that, that, that that's the idea, that when you refer to the God who make him nothing in the cross, in the sense of human being. When you refer to that, what Greek called kenosis, you may discover that, say, weakness combined with, uh, with dignity, that's a starting point of really the only one real human uh, relation. So that's probably the ground uh, on which we can build those paradoxes, because without acceptance of our weakness, uh, we can't create any 
really human society. Thank you very much, Josh. I, I, that, that's a, it's very interesting what you drew together there, this, this notion of dignity in weakness uh, and the power of the weak when it is a weakness that is a weakness infused with dignity. It seems to me that's a very powerful thing. And it brings us back to what Daniel was talking about earlier on when he was talking about respect and decency. Because one of the, the characterizations of politics now is the loss of decency. Now, I'm, I'm particularly struck by the powerful nature of an intervention, Daniel, from herself as not just a lawyer, but as someone who actually writes the law for those of us in Parliament to, to put through. You don't immediately jump to the law whenever you're speaking about how we deal with these things. You're talking about, about decency. And, and I've been very struck, for example, about the, the huge significance and importance of respect in the development of relationship. I wonder if you might let's say a little bit more about your ideas of, of decency and respect uh, and indeed dignity, uh, 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 as Darish was talking about. Yes, thank you. And I, I, I will start, if I may, by, if he will forgive me and allow me, by disagreeing with Father Yaroslav when he says that for heroism, decency is not enough. Now, I suspect probably we're not really disagreeing because what I'm going to say is I think for real heroism, and there are lots of things that look like heroism and people who think they're heroes who we might disagree with, but I think for real heroism, real decency is enough. And therefore I've immediately turned this into semantics where we can all disagree about what we mean by decency. But let me give you an illustration, which I hope will answer you, John. I watched my son and daughter-in-law taking my granddaughter to play in the park. And on the swings, on either side of her, there was another family who appeared to be, from what I could gauge, they appeared to be Orthodox Muslim family. On the other side, there was a family who, I don't know whether they had any religion or none, it was impossible to tell. They were all occupied in teaching the, the, the three children who were on these swings the core concept of, careful, don't get in his way, don't get in her way, say please, say thank you. Uh, they, they were teaching the things which a two or three year old at that age determine whether that three-year-old has Derech Eretz Kodem Torah, whether they get that human decent behavior, manners, which I, I, and, and I think, if I may say so, I think Darius talking about weakness, I really like that. I, I really embrace that as an idea because a lot of it's about give that toy back to the child next to you. Yes, she is weaker than you. Yes, you are stronger than her. And that is the reason for giving her the toy back. And it's, it's, it's that essence of decency, which I think can then be encapsulated by religion. And then if I may, Father Yaroslav, then I very much agree with what I took you to be saying that any religion comes and sits on top of that properly fashioned and developed humanity and decency and expands it and turns us into what we are as religious people but as the rabbis say if you ain't got that derech eretz first if nobody has told you it's time to come off the swing now and let have someone else have a turn you will never get the religion will never sit on top of that and be what we believe brings out the real religious humanity of us as people father yaroslav i wonder if you might want to pick up on that because I suppose one of the things that has troubled me very greatly um, in the last, uh, well, in the last three or four years particularly, and, and here I, I do trespass on the question of, of politics, it has troubled me greatly that leading figures globally have not behaved with any sense of decency with, with their own people or, or with others. I mean, I find it particularly troubling, for example, that the current president of the United States, who comes from, at least in part of his background, a relatively similar Protestant background to mine, and yet seems to be taking things in, in a dreadful way. And, and I suppose the, the concern for me is, what is it that allows religion to go wrong 
and bring about harm rather than the, the, the truth of the faith we espouse, which is there to bring good. Why does it all go so terribly wrong? Well, it's, um, I, I think I, I skipped the question on uh, Donald Trump uh, um, for obvious reasons that uh, we know that uh, politics especially um, is so much, became so much theater now, the, and especially the bad, bad theater. So we have probably the same experience in all our countries that uh, sometimes very decent people who became politicians or who act as politicians um, behave totally differently because they have, they are in the eye of the camera. They will be on the TV, they want to uh, support of a special segment of the society to grow up. So, but I would, I would um, uh, rather on the subject of decency, I would like to um, uh, uh, point to a um, something that I would call um, decency refers uh, to some um, acceptable social norms of behavior. As you, uh, as Daniel has uh, 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 said, my question um, would be: um, What those norms of behavior that we see as acceptable come from? Right? There were different norms of behavior in different societies, for example, regarding women. So, a decent behavior toward women in Western society would be regarded as indecent behavior uh, in other uh, uh, societies. In other words, the decency uh, refers to some uh, cluster, to some system of basic moral norms that help us to live together. And I do agree, they are grounded in who we are as humans. Let's use the term they are grounded in our human nature. But we know the parts of the human history were, which tend to forget about what human nature is about. So my kind of um, intervention on the decency would be that the decency perhaps has to be fueled by um, some energy that fuels this with what decency is about. Dignity, as we know, would be a typical uh, um, uh, uh, dignity of every human being was not a universally accepted notion in the history of humanity, right? It appeared at a certain moment uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the humanity and Let's say religion was not, um, um, uh, uh, I, would, I would hold that religion was quite significant in this appearing uh, of the certain notion that, that create the notion of decency. All right. Thank you very much indeed. We're, we're into the last few minutes and I'd like to just ask each of you uh, to, to respond on, on any things that you wish, but only in a minute. <laughs> but but there is one question which we've been asked, which which you may want to pick up on. And the question, as I understand it, is: Is it possible to apply this concept of solidarity in the way that we've been describing to relationships not of people with a religious perspective, but a non-religious perspective? Because we've been all been talking around religious culture traditions. Is, it, is this only relevant to people or, or with a religious perspective or what about those without a religious perspective? And if I might perhaps come Naz to you first uh, uh, and, and then to, uh, to Daniel Darish and Yaroslav. Naz. Thank you so much. I want to throw in another spanner in the works and maybe it's a future workshop, is that what do we mean by religion? Do we mean people who claim to be religious or to be speaking on behalf of religion? 
Are we talking um, about the norms of religion, the holy texts, or are we talking about a lived religion, a continuous striving to live up to um, the, 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 you know, the high practices and objectives uh, of, of, of that religion? Which takes me to, I mean, I think the notion of weakness and dignity was important, and perhaps that takes us to a realization of our common humanity um, and the, the oneness of our common humanity. And perhaps uh, that moves us to the, quest to the question we just had, that indeed a borderless solidarity was exactly what I was trying to get at, uh, in that uh, perhaps at the ages of um, less consciousness about the world and the diversity of the human family, then um, this had borders. But those were ages of greater immaturity, where we're on uh, potentially moving to a far greater maturity in un understanding our oneness. Uh, and indeed, I think we should strive towards a solidarity that is not based on culture wars or the exclusion of the other, but a, a common solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Naz. Uh, and a final word uh, from Daniel, from Darius, and from Yaroslav. Daniel. Well, I have greatly enjoyed this conversation and I'm enormously grateful to everybody Body, including the organisers. Um, I do agree with Father Yaroslav, if I may respectfully do so, that whether decency is enough or not, it certainly requires some clothing and some direction. And what I find particularly exciting about this afternoon is that coming from very different directions, we have all been excited by the concept of decency, humanity, and other similar words, dignity as underpinning and giving energy and a drive to our religious lives. I don't know whether that builds a bridge between us or not, but it's certainly that's something that I find exciting and a great source of hope. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. Darius. Oh, the qu question is extremely deep because it's a question of uh, in what can we do with our intellectual, ethical, a cultural heritage, which definitely uh, is rooted in the religious mind. So uh, can we really find an answer? Uh, what's the future of uh, human rights, for example, without religious background? Or um, I mean, can we really, are, are we really ready to defend? Will the next generation defend religious freedom in the Western countries? Uh, is the secularization the way which help us to create an answer or how should it look like uh, universal secular ethics? I'm not an optimist, frankly speaking, in that, uh, in that case. I do believe uh, that if we start to look among uh, categories from, uh, let's say, even pre-Christian heritage, we find categories like humility and pride, for example, who may help us to answer on some questions, but that's, this is a long and difficult uh, road. So the short answer on the question, is it easy to find a non-religious explanation of a teaching in Divers et Misericordia, is yes, but quite weak, that's my answer. Thank you very much, because I'm also very moved by that, I mean, how important and fruitful and inspiring for people from so many fields is still the word of solidarity, which was born 40 years ago with extreme power, which, let's say, make us with Father Jaroslav, those who we are in Poland. But it's a pleasure for us also to see that for I mean, people from many places of world, it's still so vivid and important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darish. I, I, and I get the sense that you're agreeing with Naz that we really need another workshop to explore this a little bit further. But finally, to uh, Father Yaroslav. Uh, solidarity is a very uh, powerful and wonderful uh, concept, but let me uh, warn uh, against um, some easy optimism. By this, I mean uh, taking into account that there are very powerful sources in the, every human society and in the human nature that put us apart. 
there were many ideologies that put the rich against the poor, men against women, people of different religion against uh, each other, people of different colors of skin and so on. We, the whole history of the uh, world is a powerful uh, illustration of that. The finish line, it's difficult for me to imagine that solidarity in the deep sense of this word uh, can be based um, on something else than the religious uh, reference, however we call it, but set and transcendental, uh, ultimate, ultimate ground. I also thank you very much for the invitation and I enjoy this uh, conversation very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And, and, and thank you to all of you, to Father Yaroslav Kupcha, to uh, Professor Dariusz Karovic, to Professor Nazira Ganea, and to uh, my old friend, Daniel Greenberg. Thank you also to Eva Grossman, who put all of this together and as ever has done so and remained behind the scenes. But insofar as it has worked, it has worked because she has made it work. And I want to thank uh, Eva very much indeed for that. As I said at the start, uh, this is the first of a number of webinars on the subject of solidarity. And the next webinar will take place on the 20th of November uh, next month, Solidarity Between the Generations. And there we're thinking about both environmental and financial sustainability, both things which are under major threat at this point particular time. I, I look forward to, to sharing that with them again. Uh, again, we will have uh, someone from Angelicum, uh, Helen Olford. Uh, we'll also have somebody else from the University of Oxford, Calypso Nicolaides, another professor from Oxford. Uh, we're looking forward to Carlos Galgio Gallardo from uh, the University of Seville, and also from political theology. Marek Kocci is, uh, is, we hope, going to join us. But Thank you very much to uh, my four colleagues today. I think it's been very interesting, stimulating, indeed, at times rather inspiring. And we, we have very fortunately made a recording of it, so it's going to be possible for us to go back. There are some of the things that you said uh, that I think really merit us uh, reflecting on them and teasing them out. And as I said earlier on, uh, maybe we have to pick up uh, Naz's suggestion of another workshop on this issue at a later time. But for the moment, uh, thank you. Thank all of those who listened in. Uh, and we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.